Speaking of common sense, Lauren Southern is a Canadian political activist and YouTube documentary maker who came to prominence with her films on rape culture, the murders of white African farmers, immigration and Islam. She has been described as alt-right and a white nationalist. She was detained by the Italian Coast Guard and barred from entering the UK and New Zealand. In 2016, she authored and self-published Barbarians, How Baby Boomers, Immigrants and Islam Screwed My Generation. Outsiders fans will remember she was on this show when she was touring Australia with Stefan Molyneux. They both suffered from the insidious cancel culture, being denied platforms and even a livelihood because of their views. But now, this morning, Lauren Southern has decided to get back in the saddle and has returned to the spotlight exclusively on Outsiders to be uncancelled. Has she mellowed? Has she changed her views? Lauren Southern, welcome back to Outsiders. Great to see you. Thank you for having me. Well, it's been a couple of years. You've been, uh, you've been off the radar, as it were. So what have you been doing? I was having a baby. And Congratulations. I'm very proud to say I got married to a wonderful Australian man. Of course, the very best, the very best. So let's um, have you, you... You suffered a lot of abuse. Just remind us very quickly about what happened. You were barred from one country, barred from another, Italian Coast Guard... Why did you upset so many people, Lauren? Right, so I've actually was one of the first personalities removed from the website Patreon, which is a crowdfunding site. And my crime was being against mass illegal immigration. And this was also the same thing when I was barred from entering the UK. That was for doing a stunt in which I put up posters that said Allah is gay, actually in response to an article that came out in Vice claiming Jesus Christ was gay. Right. I thought to myself, why can people say this, but they can't say Allah is gay? Now, of course, these are very inflammatory statements. And the reason I made them in these ways was because no one was willing to have these conversations publicly about the contradictions between being for LGBTQ rights, being for progressive rights, and then having immigration, which was starkly against these progressive agendas. And I thought, looking at the blue check marks on Twitter, looking at what was going on in the news, no one was willing to have these conversations. What I'm realizing more and more now, though, is people are willing to have these conversations, but it's the general public that are willing to have these conversations, not the news, not the blue check marks, not the politicians. They don't really represent the people. They're actually scaring the people into submission, into not talking about genuine, normal conversations, not right wing or left, whether you want to ask about uh, transgenderism, whether you want to ask about Islam, cultural issues. These are normal questions to ask, yet the general public are looking over their shoulder, thinking, am I going to be fired from my job? Is some rich, wealthy celebrity in Hollywood going to cancel me and tweet out a video of me just inquiring, talking about these issues? Rita. Now, do you think it's got worse in recent years since you've kind of removed yourself a little bit from, from the, uh, the furor? Has, has the situation improved or has the uh, cancel culture got worse? I think it is getting significantly more vicious because people are... are our lives are getting more uploaded onto the net. We've been disconnected from nature, we've been disconnected from our communities, and now we are disconnected from each other in more ways because of the coronavirus. We can't even go out to see each other at bars. So we're all stuck inside online, only communicating with each other through screens, and it has created this mass hatred towards one another, dehumanization of one another, which it's hilarious for me to see kind of the mainstream say this cancel culture is a purification, it's a detoxifying of the internet. We want people to be kinder and better. So we're going to dehumanize anyone who disagrees with us <laughs> and destroy their life. James. But I'm just wondering a um, couple of things. I mean, have your own views since you exited the public stage for a while, have your own views shifted a bit since then? And would that have been in response to criticism or to your own life changing? And I'd also like to just wonder what you think about the idea that maybe it's time for people on the sensible right and the sensible left to start to come together on some of these issues, because the fact of the matter is... In a lot of ways, we're all in this together, no matter which side of the reasonable side of the spectrum you're, you're on against those people who would shut everybody up if they are somehow to the right of them, even if they are, as we've seen with so many cases, on the left. 
Right. This is what's terrifying, is we know from history that radical political movements only need a very small minority of the population to agree with them in order to take power. Whether you look at Hitler's regime, Stalin's regime, they only had a small percentage that were true believers. But the reason they were able to get the rest of society to agree with them was because everyone else was terrified. They were pushed into submission by these groups and didn't want to question it, so they just went along with it. And you see this on the far, far, far right and the far, far left. They just want to get people to submit to their views. I believe, I truly believe the general public want to have conversation. They want this to be a situation where we can all talk and find the truth. Unfortunately, a few radicals in media and a few radicals that control um, all of our websites that currently we are having our conversation on, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, a lot of politicians, they don't want us to have these conversations. They want you to submit and listen. And that is a terrifying future. And it is one that is going to lead to the radicals winning. So how provocative do you need to be? You've made some provocative statements to get the message across or to get the conversation started. I'll read you a couple of ones you may have forgotten about or not, but one of the, clearly one of the most provocative statements you ever said was, so far my trip in Australia has been absolutely lovely, wonderful country, wonderful people, and then there's Melbourne. I mean, <laughs> Lauren, come on! How, and you were predicting Dan Andrews two years in advance. I mean, we say that now. We weren't saying that back then, so extraordinary. But uh, jokes aside, um, you also, uh, when you arrived in Sydney for your uh, controversial and, and, and great tour, uh, you wore a T-shirt saying it's OK to be white. Mm -hmm. Now, our, one of our politicians, Pauline Hanson, uh, and, and others tried to push a, 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 a bill through the Senate which got up and then was all controversial and got thrown out again, basically saying something similar. Um, but uh, what have you made over the last year in particular with, uh, well, the last few months really, Black Lives Matter and everything that's happened in the state since George Floyd? Oh my goodness. Well, I, it's sad because I believe that this issue is actually one of performative wokeness. You have individuals that genuinely have grievances. I think there are people within the black community in the US who would say, we are, we are poor, we want the government to help us, we want systems to help us, we want things to get better. And instead, what are they getting? They are getting a bunch of people posting black squares on their Instagram. They're getting a bunch of corporations tweeting hashtag Black Lives Matter and doing deals with Colin Kaepernick. Look at um, Adidas, Nike, Apple. Nike has a whole Black Lives Matter campaign. Meanwhile, they are actually employing slave labor in China from the Muslim Uyghur population. So this is the issue when society is being pushed by cancel culture and by people forcing them into positions is you only really hold those positions at an inch deep. As soon as the, whoever the highest bidder is switches, the corporations will go there, the masses will go there because they, they're actually interested in money. They're actually interested in just saving their bottom line and their careers. I don't doubt if some terrorist organization in the Middle East was the highest bidder and suddenly had cultural <laughs> control, you'd have Nike-sponsored trucks running around with terrorists. It's just, it's crazy. It's all about the bottom line. It's about people saving their careers and people looking good and no real change is happening. That's, a, that's a critical wokeness. point, Rita. I want to ask you about the work you did in South Africa. You were one of the first to go out there and document some of the horrific violence that's being perpetrated against uh, mainly white farmers. Uh, tell us what you found there and do you think uh, they should be granted asylum in countries like Australia? Yeah, it's a, it's a great shame what is going on in South Africa. You have a government that are creating genuine policies against a population for their race. So there are policies that say you can only have a certain amount of white workers at your corporation. Policies saying we are going to take land away from people because of their skin color. And then of course, this creates hatred among the population, which has led to a spree of murders against white South Africans. And of course, this is an issue that is it's something that causes problems for all South Africans, white and black alike. I had an individual speak to me who she said, I don't know what she's a black woman who was telling me, I don't know what's going to happen if the government continues down this pathway, because these white farmers are actually producing a large amount of our food for the country. Are we going to have starvation? Are we going to have issues with food shortages because of this hatred, this racial hatred going on? It is going to cause everyone to suffer. And 
I mean, it's for me looking at what's going on in the States and people jumping up and down about statues, about a voice actor on The Simps Simpsons. Meanwhile, you have people actually being persecuted for the race in South Africa with government policies, or you have the slave labor of Uyghur Muslims in China, and people would rather talk about statues right now. It's a tragedy. It's an absolute tragedy. James? So is the danger then that on the right, you could wind up seeing too many people falling into the same trap of the left, i.e. kind of the equivalent of performative wokeness on the other side uh, by, you know, taking out the most extreme positions and then thus turning off that great bulk of sensible middle people who would be very much uh, uh, receptive to a right-wing conservative argument that stood up against all of those people who would try and destroy our culture, destroy our civilization, but sometimes feel like, well, you know, it's you, they get caught between two extremes. And, and w w some of the more provocative things that you've said in the past may very well have contributed to that. I mean, just wonder what you would say to that. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, like when I came here and I wore my It's Okay to Be White shirt, there shouldn't be a problem with saying it's okay to be white, but that was kind of just a performance. What I actually want to do going forward is inviting people in from both sides to have a conversation. I am not afraid of showing left-wing opinions or progressive opinions in my documentary, as long as I'm showing the right-wing opinions as well, because I want everyone to have a genuine and open conversation. Sure, I think I'm gonna, gonna get a lot of criticism from a lot of the blue check marks, from a lot of the politicians and the elite class for my documentaries, but I truly believe the normal public want a conversation. The conversations that are having at pe happening at people's dinner tables are not happening on the TV screens. Twitter is not a great representative of what the general public believe. Hollywood, not a great representative of what the general public believe. We know this because we see what happened with the Trump election in the States. Every single news outlet, the New York Times, all of them, predicted it wrong because they are so out of touch. And that's something I've had to realize as well, that these crazy progressive radicals online, they are a small minority. There are left-wingers, there are people that are just in the middle that do want to talk, but they feel caught between extremes. And I want to invite people with my documentaries going forward to have a more rational, reasonable conversation. Well, Lauren, you'll be amused or horrified that uh, a recent human rights commissioner in Australia uh, said that she was appalled that people could say whatever they wanted around the kitchen table. Ooh. And, yes, yeah, so just wait. I think your next documentary should be about that kitchen table and uh, the fear of censorship coming along. Uh, now, we're going to be seeing you next week as well on, on Sky, on Cancel Culture Special, which I'm pleased to say I'll be hosting next Sunday night. Um, more importantly, you will be speaking at CPAC. I'm proud to announce on your... And the announcements went up this morning, but you will be at CPAC on... In November at the conference here in Sydney as a keynote speaker, so that's fantastic. But I hope before then we will be seeing lots more of you on Sky. Lauren Southern, welcome back. Lauren Southern, uncancelled. There you go. Thanks for having me. <laughs>